Well, you're going well. It is day four of Bangor Worldwide, and you're still with us, and we are thankful for that. Today, Gary is going to be sharing from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to hand over to him now. Let's pray together. Our loving Father, we pray that in your tenderness and your kindness, you continue to work your word deeper into our hearts and minds that we might live in the light of the coming of the Lord Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen. We have three teenage daughters, and if you want to make any of them grown, all you have to do is use two words, growth and mindset. Right at the heart of the educational philosophy controlling the Australian education system now is the push to press forward to acquire new skills and new perspectives as every student marches on to their glorious future. Or to put it a bit more succinctly, the growth mindset. Apparently in the face of a growth mindset, every concept cowers, every problem melts away, every challenge becomes an opportunity and every moan or complaint, best of all, becomes a glorious opportunity for a motivational talk from a teacher or in their absence in the, in the evenings or at the weekends from a willing parent. Now, overall, I think this is a pretty good thing. Um, I'm not sure that our girls will ever be able to forget, even if they want to, the idea that they should have a growth mindset. And I'd be very surprised if after receiving Paul's teaching and his letters that the Thessalonians were ever able to forget that they were supposed to have a growth mindset when it came to following Jesus. To forget that Christians are supposed to press on, to keep going and keep growing as they live in and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Or to use Paul's words from verse 10 of our passage, and you'll see them in verse 1 too, to live for Jesus and for one another more and more. First Thessalonians 4 is a chapter about developing a permanent growth mindset when it comes to following Jesus. Pushing on with Jesus until he returns in a way which makes the pagan world sit up and take notice. That much is obvious from the introduction to this section of the letter in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul says, let me spell out what I was hinting at in 3 verse 10 and what was anticipated in 3 verses 12 to 13. This is what it means to live for Jesus. He appeals to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, you can hear his tone as he asks and urges them to walk and to please God and to do so more and more. And he does it all on the basis of the authority of Jesus himself. Any instructions he gives comes, come from Jesus and through Jesus. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is the driving force, the, the magnetic north, the ultimate origin of all his teaching. It is Jesus who drives us to and produces in us a growth mindset. Today and tomorrow and this week and for the rest of our lives, you see, if we're followers of Jesus, we really have no option but to press on and to grow, to live a more and more kind of life. So Paul writes to the Thessalonians, urging them to listen to and pursue Christ more and more. Paul says some surprising things to them in this passage. The first dominates verses 3 to 8, and will take most of our time. That's where he tells them to be holy. Then in verses 9 to 12, he underlines the importance of, of refusing to be users, to use other people, before rounding off the passage in verses 13 to 18 um, by piling up reasons to live a more and more kind of life in the light of the coming of Christ. So we start in verses 3 to 8 with Paul's encouragement to be holy. Now, apart from singing the words of holy, holy, holy once in a while when we're going old school, we don't use the word holy much to describe our aspirations or our responsibilities as Christians. Faithful, obedient, servant-hearted, definitely. Godly, perhaps. But holy? Mm, not so much. 
I'd be surprised if the word holy made it into the list of 10 most desirable attributes amongst worldwide attenders or watchers. It may be because today being holy smells a little bit too much like being holier than thou. Or it may be for other reasons. But of this, I'm pretty confident that over the past, say, 30 years, the desire to be holy and the language of holiness has quietly slipped off our agenda. J.I. Packer wrote this some years ago. I believe that there is a need to blow the whistle on the sidelining of personal holiness that has been a general trend among Bible-centered Western Christians during my years of ministry. It's not a trend that one would have expected, Packer writes, since Scripture insists so strongly that Christians are called to holiness, that God is pleased with holiness but outraged by unholiness, and that without holiness none will see the Lord. But despite Packer's best efforts, not much much has changed. For some reason today, holiness as a category has slipped off our lips and out of our minds. I'm not even sure I can remember the last time I heard someone say, I just long to be holy. Can you? So listen to these words of Paul from verse 3. For this is the will of God, your holiness. Of course, Paul's not just telling us to clean up our lives. According to this powerful statement, this is the will of God, your holiness. God has both declared that we will be holy and commanded that we should be. How good is that? Or James Denny thought for the day. Sanctification is the one task which we can face confident that we're not left to our own resources. God is not the taskmaster master we have to satisfy in our own poor efforts, but the holy and loving Father who inspires us and sustains us from first to last. To fall in with his will is to enlist all the spiritual forces of the world in our aid. It is to pull with instead of against the spiritual tide. Isn't that a wonderful thought that if we're striving to be holy, we're swimming with the tide? See, this powerful reality is what makes it possible for Paul to urge them and by extension us to embrace and pursue holiness, which is God's will for us. You see, this section starts and ends with calls to recognize that we are the holy people of God who've already been made holy, who are being made holy, and who will one day be perfectly holy. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, your holiness. Verse 7, for God has not called us for impurity, but into holiness. See, the surprising thing here is that Paul is happily using a very Old Testament concept, which is fleshed out so powerfully in passages like Leviticus 17 to 26, to describe the Thessalonians, who are mostly Gentiles. The ultimate Jewish boundary marker of holiness is now the thing that makes Gentile Christians, like most of us, stand out as God's grand plans to draw people to himself from every tribe and nation get into full swing. What does this holiness look like? How do they maintain this kind of life in the face of the massive pressures of idle-mad, sex-mad Thessalonica? Well, Paul gives them three commands and three reasons to be holy. The three commands are in verse 3 to verse 6. This is the will of God, your, ho- uh, your holiness. First, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Second, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. And thirdly, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. The word sexual immorality here, it's, uh, the Greek word porneia, is an important one. See, for Paul, this doesn't simply mean having questionable sexual ethics or behavior. Pornea is the telltale mark of idolatrous societies which deserve the judgment of God. For Paul, idolatry leads to sexual immorality, which in turn will lead to judgment. And it's easy for us to miss just how sexualized life in the Greco-Roman world was. Demosthetes, who was probably the greatest of the Greek orators, famously said in the 4th century BC, Mistresses we keep for our pleasure, concubines for our day-to-day physical well-being, 
in wa and wives in order to bear us legitimate children and to serve as trustworthy guardians over our households. The Roman Cicero said in the first century BC that if anyone thinks that young men should be forbidden to have affairs with prostitutes, he's very strict indeed. For his view is contradictory not only to the law of the present age, but even with the habits of our ancestors and with what they considered allowable. For when was this not a common practice? When was it blamed or forbidden? That was the general atmosphere in the Roman Empire and in Thessalonica. On top of that, you need to remember that Thessalonica's main sport was idolatry. There were 25 plus temples in the center of the city. The most popular religions were the cults of Cabiris and Dionysus, both of which involved having sex at their temples as often as possible. Thessalonian society was degenerate. Like, like almost every city in the Roman Empire, they had sinned away any sense of right and wrong. Now, it's so important to remember as we try to come to terms with the onslaught of sexualization in our society that there really is nothing new under the sun. We belong to a movement which was born in what was probably the most sexually promiscuous, sexually deviant, sexually charged society which has ever existed. So let's not panic to misquote glory again or we will survive. Instead of panicking or just wringing our hands at the state of society, going to the dogs around us, let's throw ourselves into being holy as a sign of the fact that we are part of the people of God. And how do we do that? Well, just let's look at these three commands. The first is separate yourself. Abstain from immorality is in essence a command to make a clean break from the culture around, to be different. Of course, this was more easily said than done in a context where every aspect of life was steeped in idolatry and sexual promiscu promiscuity. Uh, several years ago, we became Australian citizens. Uh, in one way, it was a landmark for us as a family, but to be honest, not much was really changed. We simply added another passport to our collection for neither Ireland nor the UK nor Australia demands that we give up previous citizenships. So we just add Australian to the list and get on with living pretty much as we did before. Uh, still supporting Ireland and the rugby, of course. But becoming a Christian wasn't like that for the Thessalonians. To commit to Christ was to commit to causing trouble, rocking the boat. It was to commit to a life of endless disruption at work and at home, to be a fly in the ointment at every family gathering, every community celebration, to be the one who suddenly won't sleep with prostitutes at the temple, who won't make the family offering, who makes life awkward and complicated for everyone else all the time. So Paul understands that it's going to be hard to live for Jesus in that context. So he says, whatever you do, don't get sucked back into the life that you've left. Now, we do have to be a little bit careful here. Paul is not saying that we should shun people who are sexually immoral. For to do that would be effectively to cut ourselves off from the world in which we live, a world which desperately needs to hear of and encounter Christ. But he is saying that we, that you and I need to make a clean break with the ways of thinking and acting which characterize our fallen world. We can't go back there. Because we belong to Christ, there should be things that we won't do, places we won't go, ways that we won't act, because there's simply too much at stake. Because in the words of 1 verse 9, we have turned from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We need to separate ourselves from sexual promiscuity and idolatry to make a clean break from living for ourselves. It is, of course, more than possible that this is exactly the message that you need to hear today. Being someone who's committed to the worldwide is no guarantee that we haven't chosen silently to plunge back into immorality. We live in a world where the pull is very strong and the opportunities to sin sexually are everywhere. So hear the word of God. Separate yourself. Abstain from immorality. And control yourself. 
Verse 4, eat that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who don't know God. Now buried in this verse is one of the trickiest problems in New Testament interpretation. It all hinges on the translation of the word uh, body in verse 5. The, the word basically means vessel, or kind of pot. And it could be that Paul is saying that men and women just need to control their bodies generally or their sexual organs in particular, or it may even mean that husbands need to, to lead their wives well. I'll spare you the pain and tell you that I think on balance the English Standard Version is almost certainly right. Paul is making a general appeal to display the fruit of the Spirit by showing some self-control. See, holiness, it turns out, is basically a matter of honoring Jesus Christ by controlling yourself, by making wise and godly choices, by doing what the rest of the New Testament regularly calls dying to yourself, by refusing to be driven by your instincts no matter how deeply rooted. The Thessalonians had come from a world where gratifying your instincts was healthy and normal, but God says, control yourself. It's actually startling how relevant this is. In case you hadn't noticed, we live in a world where following through your desires, your instincts, your urges is a basic human right. Every woman should have the right to choose. Every couple should have the right to be married if they want. Every person should have the right to define their gender in whatever way they want to, to choose their pronoun. See, not since the time of Paul has it been quite so easy to go with the flow and quite so hard to swim against it. Self-indulgence has been institutionalized in our society. The question is, has it become normal for us? For Paul says, control yourself. And there's a third command. He says, don't harm other people, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Now, this could simply be an acknowledgement that sexual promiscuity wreaks emotional and relational havoc on everyone involved. Or, like Paul's discussion of sacrificing meat to idols in 1 Corinthians, it may be a warning that failing to break with idolatry and with all its ramifications actually imperils the faith of your brothers and sisters. If you don't make a clean break with this stuff, it will so confuse and distress new converts who are still trying to disentangle themselves from the web of Thessalonian cults that for them it actually may become a salvation issue. That rather than following Christ, they're sucked back into idolatry. And that's probably the first of the reasons that Paul uh, ties in with the first reason that Paul offers for separating yourself, controlling yourself and refusing to harm others. So does damaging other people figure in your thinking? Do we ever ask ourselves, do my choices send a clear and unambiguous message to new believers, to outsiders? Paul says we need to factor this in because we're responsible for one another. See, we need to embrace holiness by separating ourselves, controlling ourselves, and making sure we don't damage other people. And then Paul gives three reasons to back up that triplet of commands. The first is because of the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you before, Anne, and solemnly warned you. Paul's quoting from Psalm 94 here, but he actually substitutes Lord, the Jesus title for God. His point is that one day we will all have to face the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And what will he expect of us? The holiness that he alone can produce. Now, it is true that the word avenger here carries none of the negative connotations of the English term, you know, vicious, over-the-top payback. This is a picture of a just judge in action, but I'm not sure it's any less terrifying for that. Paul is extremely forthright in warning the Thessalonians of the reality of the coming judgment. You see, the New Testament is extremely candid on the fate of those who refuse to listen to the commands of God. The brute fact is that, as Hebrews 12 says, we need to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Flip that around and you see that without holiness, we face judgment. Without holiness, we will face the judgment of Christ himself. There's the choice we face, holiness or the judgment of Christ. That's a pretty good reason to be holy. That's his first. And the second, 
Well, it's actually the fact that the Father has called us to be holy. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Paul has in mind here the fact that God, the Father, has called us to be his holy people, as he did right, right back in Exodus 19 and elsewhere. This is an appeal to who we already are in Christ. As in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. Beloved, Peter goes on, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be who you are because God has called you as his people so that one day the nations will see us, God's people, and bow down in awe before our God and King. That's the second reason. And the third it's actually because you've got the Holy Spirit. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. The word holy in this phrase, the Holy Spirit, isn't the usual one, but it's chosen very carefully to continue this emphasis on the necessity of people like you and me being holy. This time, not just because of coming judgment or our identity, but because of the Spirit himself, the one who lives in us, making us holy. Back in Ezekiel 36, God had said this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See, God has given us the spirit to speak to the nations to us as he displays his holiness in it. Our holiness is at the core of his plans, which takes us right back to where we started. For this is the will of God, your holiness. So why are we going with this? Do we think about holiness, pray for holiness, long for holiness, strive together for holiness? We really should. Jim Packer again, if we play down or ignore the importance of holiness, we are utterly and absolutely wrong. Holiness is commanded. God wills it. Christ requires it. And all the scriptures call for it. So what are we to do? Surely we're to throw ourselves onto our God again as we throw ourselves into living for him according to his desires and his command. Surely we've got to take this seriously to recalibrate our whole way of looking at ourselves if necessary, to shape and reshape the way in which we look at the world in line with the fact that God's will for us is holiness. We need to listen to the warnings and incentives of these verses. So let me be really blunt. Do you long to be holy? When was the last time you or I even thought about our personal holiness? When was the last time we prayed asking God to do his will in us to make us holy? When was the last time we ached because we fall so far short of that? I suspect there may be time for a mini reformation among God's people. As we rediscover the New Testament's teaching on holiness. And there's no better place to start than 1 Thessalonians 4. James Denny sums up this whole section in words so powerful and tender that I couldn't match them. Um, so here's James Denny again. It is our sanctification he desires. To this he calls us. For this he works in us. Instead of shrinking from us because we are so unlike him, he puts his Holy Spirit into our impure heart. He puts his own strength within our reach that we may lay hold upon it. He offers us his hand to grasp. It is this searching, condescending, patient, omnipotent love which is rejected by those who are immoral. They grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that spirit which Christ has won for us by his atoning death and which is able to make us clean. There is no power which can sanctify us but this, nor is there any sin which is too deep or too black for the Holy Spirit to overcome. So be holy. 
Now, part of me would like to stop there. But Paul doesn't, so we won't either. So be holy. And then much more briefly in verses 9 to 12, don't, don't be a user. Look at how Paul continues. Now, concerning brotherly love, you've no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, for that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. See, Paul draws a straight line from pleasing God to holiness to loving each other. It seems, though, in the church family in Thessalonica, something has gone wrong along that line. Their holiness has been compromised, and as a result, their love for others has turned into a desire to sponge off other people. We'll see a bit more of this in chapter 5, but it seems that at least some of the church have decided that as Jesus was on the very point of returning, uh, we'll just give up work and we'll happily allow other people to fund our eschatological holiday. As a result, the general population were being turned off the gospel by their selfishness. So Paul attempts to bring them back down to earth with four more commands. First, Paul says that they've been taught by God. That's a word made up by Paul. It only occurs here in all of Greek literature. But it's a fulfillment for Paul of Isaiah 54, where on the day of the Lord, the Gentiles would receive teaching. So Paul says, now that you've been taught by God, get on with loving people more and more. Even though they had a great track record in the love department, they'd already shown their commitment to the gospel movement in Macedonia. Paul says, you, you can't rest on your laurels. You need to do it more and more. See, it's pretty obvious as Christians, we've never arrived. We never get to the point where we can say, I've done my bit and we can put our feet up. Christian maturity isn't ultimately about what we know or how much we know or even about what we've done in the past. It's about ongoing, growing personal holiness and love for others. And the problem with personal holiness is very hard to pull off full stop. And the problem with love for others is that other people have the really annoying habit of making it hard for us to love them and to keep loving them. And there's the fact that just when we think we might be getting some, we're getting a handle on the people we already know, not only do those people probably change, and, and find new ways of being hard to love, but new people show up and we have to throw ourselves into loving them as well. And while we're doing that, our oldest friends develop a whole new set of ways in which they now need to be loved, and it goes on and on and on, so we need to love more and more and more. Welcome to the Christian life. But this is what matters. This is our focus. This should preoccupy us. This is what we should be praying for every day. That's why Paul adds, and aspire to live quietly. In the Greco-Roman world, to live a quiet life isn't to retire. It's to throw yourself into what really matters rather than sticking your nose into other people's business or in this case, being a huge burden on others. Plato, for example, describes a philosopher as one who lives quietly and minds his own business. Paul says a follower of the Lord Jesus is one who gets on with loving God and loving other people. This is the main game. To work with your hands isn't prioritizing manual labor over working in an office. The emphasis is on the working bit. Earn your living rather than sucking other people dry. Why does it matter? The final phrase in verse 12 is the key. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. See, the issue here is people in Monica being called the wrong things. The outsiders presumably couldn't care less about why the Thessalonians had given up work. The issue for them was that they were visibly and obviously sponging off other people. And that was more than enough to allow the community to dismiss them as lazy and so dismiss the gospel. Paul says, don't use and abuse people, but love them, love them, because if you do that, you'll commend the gospel rather than putting people off. In Thessalonica, sponging off other people was a complete turnoff for the general population. Paul tells them, but for the sake of the gospel, and to focus on loving people in a way which commends the gospel. I do wonder what the cultural turnoffs are in this generation 
for people in Northern Ireland. Flip it around. I wonder what it will be in the years ahead that will make the Church of Jesus Christ stand out in our increasingly secular, increasingly secularized, increasingly sexualized world. Could it possibly be that personal holiness and love for others might be the thing to do it? And why should we throw ourselves into this kind of Christ-like, hard yards life of holiness and love? Well, that takes us to 4, 13 to 18, and with that, we're finished. See, undergirding all this for Paul is the simple fact that Christ is coming back. To live a life of holiness, of love for other people, is to live in the light of his coming. Now, I have to say, there are some things that have never cost me even a microsecond of concern. I can honestly say I've never worried about whether there might be an adequate hairdryer in the hotel room. I've never, ever panicked that I might bump my head going through a door. I've never stressed over who won yesterday's tooth in the maze. Nor I, have I ever felt the tiniest twinge of concern that Christians who die before the return of Christ might miss out. But that really was bugging the Thessalonians. No one's absolutely sure of what was going on in the Thessalonians' minds as they thought about death, and in particular the death of church members, but this much is very clear. Their strange views of the future meant that they were grieving pretty much like everybody else. And that's the key for Paul. Because they'd missed out on Jesus' teaching to the thief on the cross next to him, today you will be with me in paradise. That those who die go directly to the presence of Christ, to wait with Christ for the consummation of all things. Because the Thessalonians hadn't got that, it meant they were disappointed when their friends died, and so they grieved in a way that was just like everybody else and so completely obscured the hope of the gospel. It may be they got a bit confused over the significance of Jesus' resurrection. They may have thought that if you die between Jesus' first coming and his return, you get sent to the back of the eschatological queue, perhaps missing out on all the fun of a resurrection body. It may be that the Thessalonians hadn't quite managed to throw off their pagan skepticism about life after death in general. In the Greco-Roman world, expectations of dying, uh, sorry, expectations of anything beyond dying were pretty low. Gravestones in and around Macedonia bore cheery inscriptions like this, I was not, and I was, I am not, and I care not. Or this one, we are nothing. A reader, from nothing to nothing. And one more, if you want to know who I am, the answer is ash and burnt numbers. That kind of thing may well have affected them. But whatever was going through their heads, the Thessalonians faced death with half-hearted hope at best. At best. They were looking forward to Jesus' return in theory, but they hadn't really come to terms with what his resurrection meant for all of us who die in the meantime. So when somebody died, they mourned like Thessalonians and so obscured the power of the gospel. And that brings us to one of the most beautifully and powerful and encouraging passages in the entire New Testament. As Paul gives us a really succinct account of what we could expect in the face of death, of what will happen as history moves to a conclusion, and why we should stand out in a world which is without God and without hope. So verse 13. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that those who died, that we may not grieve as others who, do, who have no hope. Now, that's what he's aiming for. That's the purpose, which is why Paul closes up by saying, encourage each other with these words so that you don't grieve like everyone else. And let me reassure you, Paul's teaching here really does make a difference. This truth has legs. On the 12th of February, 2002, my mum died of a massive heart attack at 61. Her Thanksgiving service took place a couple of days later. 
Oscar felt able to do was to take family left that to our family and pastor in Lisburn. But I did have one request. I asked him to speak on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, which he did. And as we sang the final song, Thine be the glory, risen, and is the victory. We cried, but we cried joy-filled tears of hope. Because we did not grieve as those who have no hope. How can we sing and give thanks and rejoice in the face of death only because of the twin truths that hold everything that Paul says in these verses together? You'll see the first in 4 verse 14. It's the fact that we've all been joined to Christ. For since we believe, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Paul's expression here is highly condensed, which makes, which makes it easy to miss his basic point. Theologically speaking, Paul's argument rests on the fact that if we've been joined to Jesus in his death and resurrection, then nothing can separate us from him. Romans 6 verse 5 says, if we've been united to him in a death like his, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For Paul, this is so basic, so fundamental, he doesn't even need to go over it again. If Jesus died and rose and we've been united to him by faith, then of course those have already died get to enjoy the riches of the new creation with Christ. They have to because they've been permanently united to Christ by faith. Those who died for the resurrection, far from missing out, will get to join in Jesus' arrival parade as he makes his way back up to set up the new creation. See, this is really important. That because we are united to Christ when we trust him, we can never be separated from him. This is who we are. We've been inextricably, insolubly, inseparably bound to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can ever separate us from him. Nothing can ever reduce us to the status of second-class citizens, relegate us to the cheap seats. Say it however you want. We are his. He is our. He will bring everyone with him who has died before us. It's a mark of being real important that when you come to visit, you don't come alone. You have your team of outsiders. A long time ago in Dublin, I once took part in an opening ceremony for the new clubhouse at uh, Sutton Golf Course, just north of Dublin, where for the sake of the gospel, I'd accepted honorary membership. I know, tough gig, but someone had to do it. I shared the, the formalities with uh, the Taoiseach, with the Prime Minister of Ireland, Bertie Ahern. I drove up as usual, found a spot somewhere near the back of the car park. He roared up in a cavalcade headed by police motorcycle outriders. I came in through the men's locker room and made my way up the back stairs to the dining room. He was greeted at the front door by the club captain and the president of the club and escorted up the main staircase. His people were there in advance, checking the lectern was at the right height. The prime ministerial crest was in position, handing him his notes as he strode up to the lectern to rapturous applause. He was introduced to the gathering by his aide de camp. When it came to my turn, I was announced with the words, and now someone is going to say a prayer. Now, you don't need me to tell you which Christ's return will be like. The word he, Paul uses here, that's the word uh, uh, parousia, was universally understood to mean a royal visit. When the emperor or other high official came to visit a city in the Roman Empire, it was called his parousia. And when he showed up with his entourage, it was a spectacular event. Now, when Jesus comes, he'll come with the most impressive entourage in all of history. As Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and Peter and Paul and Timothy and John and Augustine and Luther and Calvin and George Whitfield and John Wesley and C.S. Lewis and my mum and a vast host of faithful ones from across all history will come with him because they've been joined to him by faith and will never be separated from him. And because of this, we will not grieve as those who have no hope. We've all been joined to Christ. Nothing will separate us from him. And then in verses 15 to 17, Paul says, remember, we will all enjoy Christ forever. See, Paul starts off by insisting that this, this isn't a matter of his personal speculation. For this we declare to you 
by a word from the Lord, the Lord Jesus himself. Now, it's either an otherwise unknown saying of Jesus or more likely a rough quotation of Matthew 24, 30 to 39. But either way, Paul says, Jesus made it clear what will happen when he comes back. I'm clarifying that those who have already died are not disadvantaged. We who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul, following Jesus, lays out four basic steps which lead up to us enjoying Christ forever. You can see the first in verse 16. The Lord descends. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Christ, the risen king, returns to earth from his father's side and issues a, issues a cry of command, which is aimed at primar primarily at Jesus himself said this would happen in John 5. An hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus summons those who've died before us to come and join in the parade. At the same time, the voice of an archangel will sound. It's an allusion to Daniel 12. There'll be a trumpet blast, the same one that always announced the coming of God in Testament in Isaiah 27 and Joel 1 and Zechariah 14, the same trumpet blast that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. And in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So the Lord comes back with all those who have been in his presence since they died then everyone will be changed. Paul says the dead in Christ will rise first. It's as if those who have been with Christ in spirit get the resurrection bodies first and come back to join the rest of us. But the end result is clear. Everyone is raised. Now remember the concern that Paul's addressing is the fact that those who are already dead might miss out. But actually for him, the dead in Christ seem to be the ones who get to the front of the resurrection queue. Those who are waiting in the presence of Christ right now, they get their, ready, their resurrection body first in the presence. And all having been changed, we all join the coming Lord. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What's crystal clear is that everyone, both dead and now resurrected Christians, and those who are alive, when the Lord descends, not also transformed, we all join in this enormous celebration of the triumphal arrival of Jesus the King. Those who are dead in his presence is fine with them. Those of us alive, we get transformed to go up to meet him as part of the reception committee. Now, there are just a few questions raised by that that I do need to deal with before I stop. For a start, does this verse teach a rapture where us believers are snatched away to leave the rest of you to whatever horrible stuff happens? When I was a teenager, this was an extremely popular view. Um, many of you will remember seeing The Thief in the Night, uh, probably on um, very well-worn uh, masks of film projected in a church hall somewhere. I can well remember my younger brother coming into my room to wake me at three in the morning and flipped the tears the night after we watched it because he thought that the rest of the family had been raptured and he'd been left behind. Even in my teens, I had the heart of a pastor and told him to shut up and go back to bed. Now, the, the idea that we'll be snatched away in secret is based on Latin translation of the phrase caught up, or rapio, hence the rapture. In the ancient world, however, that phrase is most often and used to people snatched away by death. And Paul is choosing this language to contrast the way in which Jesus snatches people to himself as he comes to snatch us to live with the way in which death snatches us. But the main thing here is, it's not just an argument about words. Everything about this scene is public. Jesus' victory parade, his grand reception from those who are alive, it all happens in full view of everyone. So there's no secret rapture here. But do we get to fly in the clouds? Well, sort of. In the Old Testament, clouds are so frequently associated with God showing up 
that it's almost certain that to speak of being caught up by the clouds means to be caught up in the dramatic coming of God himself. This, this parousia, this coming, is a divine event like those at the Red Sea and Sinai and the dedication of the temple and the transfiguration and, and, and. As Jesus draws those of us who are still alive to himself as God the coming king, well, how else would we travel but on the clouds? Meeting Christ in the area is not so much a promise of levitation as a directional indicator. This great parade comes together from above and from below and everyone meets up in the air. It's a grand visual rep representation of the fact that everyone will join the coming Lord. The phrase translated to meet the Lord actually means for a reception of the Lord. The, the word used is the word for a formal reception of a visiting dignitary. The coming of the king leads to a reception, not a delegation in the ancient world, but often be sent dressed in white robes, crowned with laurel, to welcome the great visitor halfway to the city, laying praise on him. The phrase was so common that the Roman Cicero, who was writing in Latin, could just use that Greek word when describing Julius Caesar's victorious return to Italy in 49 BC. It actually occurs untranslated in rabbinic writings as well to, risk, to describe Paul's reception in Rome in Acts 28. See, this is a picture of Jesus coming with the saints who have died to be received by those who are still alive in a great final joyful celebration. So there is no secret rapture described here, no buzzing razors in the sink, no unattended lawnmowers or crashing planes, but a breathtaking promise that all of us, we live to see the return of Christ or not, will be caught up in the victorious return of God to establish his reign forever on a renewed earth. And this isn't a new idea. Listen to these words from John Chrysostom in the fourth century. For as when a king ceremoniously, ceremoniously entered a city, certain dignities and city rulers and many others who were confident toward the sovereign would go out of the city to meet him, but the guilty and the condemned criminals would be guarded within, awaiting the sentence which the king would deliver. In the same way, when the Lord comes, those who are confident toward him will meet him in the midst of the air, but the condemned who are conscious of having committed many sins will wait below for their judge. So the Lord descends, everyone is changed, we all join him at all. We all enjoy life with God forever. The last is that could easily be overlooked. That would be a mistake because it's where this whole passage, in fact, the whole work of God are and so we will always be with the Lord. All of us, irrespective of whether we die and go to be with Christ to wait or are still alive when the king comes, we get to be with Jesus Christ forever. Here's the reason why people like you and me can cry tears of hope. Here's why we can live lives of holiness. Here's why we can love. Here's why we can rejoice even in the face of death. Not simply because Christ has defeated death, which he has, but because we get to be with him, to spend time without end with him, to delight in him, to marvel at his tenderness, his beauty, his power, his ingenuity, to bask in his unimaginable, inexhaustible love. We get to be with Jesus Christ always. This is why Paul tells us all this. Not so that our curiosity might be satisfied, but so that we might trust him and obey him and live for him and with him, that we might live in the light of his coming. That we might live like the Lord Jesus Christ as people whose, people whose lives are marked by holiness and love. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen.
is happening today at Bangor Wide at 3pm today is the ladies seminar and you can catch that on YouTube and that's going to be a great treat for the ladies and indeed this year some of you men can tune in as well. Also to say that our evening celebration is going to be on again tonight at half past seven um, as you hear what God is doing around the world. can I encourage you uh, to consider giving to Bangor Wide as well. You can either text to give, give online or give by check and there's lots of information of how you can do that online if you're watching the short giving video but we're so thankful to all of you who have been giving and continue to give to God's work through Bangor Worldwide. Let's pray. Father we do need you so much as we consider this challenge to be holy for you are holy. Father as we gaze on your holiness, we indeed see our own holiness, that we are indeed men and women of unclean lips. Father, I pray that your spirit will work in us to conform us more and more to the image of your Son. And with, Father, would you help us to strive for holiness. Father, I pray that we would be different to the culture and to the world around us. Father, I pray that we would indeed refuse to be users. But Father, I pray that we would use all that you have given to us and for your glory and to make your name known among the nations. Father, we pray that we would throw our lives into what really matters. Father, to loving you and loving others. Father, would you help us to see everything as secondary to this? And would we, as your church indeed, be so different to the world around us as we do this? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a good day.